Hey, Dr. Glegg. Hello, good afternoon, Ms. Khan. Hey, how are you? Pretty good, thank you. Good, well, thank you so much. Um, out of your busy schedule, you are giving us time. I, I know your itinerary must be really occupied. Thank you so much, we really appreciate that. Most welcome. So in a few minutes, as Benjamin comes back. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm back. Oh, Ben is back. Hi, Ben. Hello. Ben, Dr. Glegg, Dr. Glegg, Ben. You're welcome. How are you, Mr. Norman? Pleased Good. to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, too. So, um, Dr. Glegg, we are recording this interview or this discussion, if you may. Um, and this will be live streamed, uh, not live streamed, but it will be streamed in on Facebook, um, our, our social media as well. So we do have your permission, correct? Yes, you do. Okay, so uh, we'll send you the links later on. Uh, so you can share it with your, um, uh, when you go back to Jamaica with your peers and, and let them know how much fun you had with NPU. Um, so um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I know uh, you have uh, engagements, appointments after this. So I'll keep it brief, keep it short. Um, but I know uh, while, since you're here, we, we cannot have you go without sharing your expertise with our sector, our constituents. So um, getting started with the um, introduction, I if I start talking about your credentials, your background, your I don't know, I will be on for another, what, two hours in regards to that. So what I will do is I will say hello and I'll allow you to go ahead and give us your brief introduction, your affiliations and the kind of work that you do and, and in relation to COVID, the kind of teams that you're involved with in Jamaica and then we'll go from there. Okay, so I have been a medical practitioner for uh, about 20 years. I'm currently um, practicing general surgery at the St. Anne's Bay Regional Hospital. And that's in Jamaica. It's close to Ocho Rios, if anyone knows Ocho Rios. Uh, I'm also an attorney at law. And I'm the senior legal officer for the University Hospital of the West Indies. Um, that's a premier teaching institution in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, my capacity as the attorney for the hospital, I'm also a part of the COVID-19 task force for the University Hospital, and I represent the University Hospital um, in the Emergency Operations um, Center at the Ministry of Health in Jamaica that deals directly with the um, issues regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Jamaica. Oh, wow. So, I mean, you don't find many of this in uh, regular population, a lawyer and a doctor. So how many years of school are we talking about here? In total, I spent about 15 years as one five years at the university level. Oh my God. So one, one degree was, one profession was not enough. No, you know, they go hand in hand. And it, it was a natural uh, progression for me as a surgeon, I had to give evidence in, in many cases. So as always in court. So it was just a natural progression to prepare myself for my job as an expert witness. Wow. All right. So we are lucky to have you here today. So um, Dr. Glegg, era of COVID-19. Everybody's, that's the hot topic everybody's talking about. Now that we have you here, how are you guys dealing with uh, either managing it, controlling it um, in Jamaica um, at University of West Indies Hospital um, and, and in general overall, overall over there? And um, what would you suggest from your experience um, to our constituents here understanding of, of this pandemic, um, the reality of it, um, and, and how to live daily life. The, the saying is finding a new norm. So starting from Jamaica, and then let's see, make your steps towards NPU and advising them. So with the government of Jamaica and by extension, the University Hospital of the West Indies, we started very aggressive early on in the process. Uh, Jamaica was one of the first countries in the world to close our borders um, to flights from China. 
and we actually shut down our airports for for a few quite a few weeks um, the only flights we allowed in were dire medical emergencies one of the things we also did was was a massive education campaign to get members of the public educated and involved in not only protecting themselves and their families but also protecting the community from the COVID-19 virus. So our first step was to prevent the virus from entering the island. The second step, once the virus had, had entered, we moved towards um, containing it uh, in terms of dealing with the, the cluster spread, you know, spread in homes and in communities, and we would isolate and quarantine whether an individual, a town, or even a city. You know, we would quarantine certain areas so that we would control the spread of the virus. That worked quite well for a while. Uh, then we got to the stage where the virus moved from cluster spread to community spread. And, you know, certain, certain though, though we have a constitution that guarantees certain legal rights, rights of freedom to movement and right to gather in public places, um, one of the things that we did in, in our system was to make it a law that you could not go in a public place without wearing a mask. You could actually be, be arrested for being in a public space without wearing a mask. And we also ha currently have a curfew in place in Jamaica between the hours of 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. so as to limit uh, people having parties and gatherings to, to, to enforce um, you know, uh, the, the prevention of, of you know, the spread of the virus. From the American perspective, you know, America is one of the most liberal and free countries in the world. And, and that's the strength of the United States of America. And my advice to people in America and, and to Georgia in general, is that you have to get members of the public involved in the process. That's the first step. You have to get individuals to realize that they play, each individual play an important part in this process by protecting themselves, by protecting their families. Uh, the second thing is as much as possible, have individuals practice social distancing and use the proper um, personal protective equipment. This is very important. But more importantly, as my boss always says, my boss is a, is, is a very famous neurosurgeon, Dr. Carl Bruce, you know, he always says, listen to the experts, listen to the scientists. And that's one of the things the government of Jamaica did from early on in the process. We allowed the, the epidemiologists, we allowed the public health experts, we allowed the infection control people to take the lead in developing the policies that were involved in um, fighting the coronavirus. And we've done a fairly good, I mean, for the first few months, we had like, you know, dozens of cases, then it went to, um, you know, over 100 and 200. Now we're in October, I think we've now gone to, we had a spike recently, but for a population of 3 million people, we have only 6,000 cases or a little over 6,000 cases. And I think we have less than 100 deaths. So for the most part, most persons have um, recovered. But to me, the most important thing is one of the things that you know has made this country a great country is whenever it's faced with an existential threat, the USA has always had the power to tap into the great resource of this country. And one of the greatest resource in this country are its people, its population, its diverse people. And, you know, I, you know, I think um, the, the US should approach this no different from it, it approached the Second World War or, 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 or any other major global um, issue that faced it, because this is a global issue. And, you know, I think the Americans should deal with it in such a way because it is a war, but unfortunately, this enemy is an unseen enemy. And this is an enemy that attacks from within. 
Right. So, um, Dr. Glig, uh, with the restrictions that Jamaica has placed and the curfews and having a law, so down to the community level, how do you see the reaction of the community to all that? How are they following? I mean, it, is it smoothly followed? We can say, In or what do you see the resistance? Initially, it was followed very smoothly. But I think after a while, people just got COVID burnout. Being at home for a long time, unable to go party, to go have a good time, to go to church. After a while, you know, and, and which is why I think we eventually had that spike because uh, we had the buy-in of the population earlier on. I think after a while, you know, individuals just got tired of being in lockdown and being at home. And, you know, they started going to the beach. And on the public holidays, the beaches were full, the rivers were full. And, 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 and this can be used as a learning experience because you have to now manage the mental aspect of the population. You have to understand that humans, especially if you are accustomed to moving around and, and having certain freedoms before, this has to be managed. And I think the best way to do it is do it in, in a phased way. So um, a good example is early out and you know we had said, okay, persons over 65 should really stay home or persons who have chronic um, diseases that will put them at risk. So we're gonna have to find some way of dealing with the mental health spin-off from people always being at home, people who are accustomed to being away. All of a sudden, now you're locked in a house with five people, three people, and you know that has its side effects. Right. So I think we're gonna have to figure out how, how to deal with this side of the pandemic. And I'm gonna to get to that definitely because that is quite a challenge for many communities, including our constituents as well. Um, so before we dive further into it, you being a medical doctor as well, and you are part of the task force at the hospital and you are treating and, and seeing as COVID patients come in. So go ahead and, and let us know, what is COVID? A quick spin of that. What are you seeing? What is this virus? What is it doing to people? People with comorbidities and those who don't have. So what are the chances for those who have comorbidities to have it? Or is it, is it hitting them more than the others? So go ahead and clarify that for us a little bit. Okay, so this is, is uh, from a special group of viruses known as RNA viruses. And it's called Corona because it has these spikes that come off the surface of it that looks like a crown. Now, if you've ever had the common cold, you know, little sniffles, a little runny nose, you know, you have had a coronavirus infection before. But what makes this virus different, the novel coronavirus or, or SARS COVID-19 is that this virus is highly highly, highly contagious. It spreads very easily, very quickly. And unlike someone who's had the common cold where you get a little runny nose and you feel, uh, you know, a little ill for maybe half a day. Uh, the thing about this virus, what makes it so unique is that many persons who have this infection will not show any symptoms at all, okay? There are some people who will have a mild illness, but not sick to the extent that they can't move about or leave home. But there are a few people who get extremely ill. And it is as a result of in, in this percentage of individuals, maybe about two to 5%, depending on the population. And what happens with these individuals is that their immune system overreacts in a hyper way to the presence of the virus in their bodies. And what it does, especially in the um, respiratory system, in, in, in the lungs, is that the tissues in the lungs, the lining of the lungs, start to secrete lots amount of fluids. So it's called, um, it is called a literal cytokine storm because literally there's now a storm that is forming within your lungs. And so these individuals, pretty much drown from within, 
you know, you know, and, and they present with shortness of, of breath, difficulty breathing. There are some that, you know, we can manage with antivirus and we, we give like dexamethasone. I know, um, you know, we've been experimenting with remdesivir and, and other, other antivirals. Um, and, you know, they're usually also given antibiotics to deal with any secondary bacterial infection that may super, superimpose it itself um, on the viral infection. But for many, if you are that ill that you end up in the intensive care unit, then it spells trouble. But also if you have any other underlying illness like diabetes, hypertension, leukemias, cancers, mm -hmm. or certain other underlying illnesses, or if you are you know, above a certain age, a senior citizen, then you will have a greater risk of um, dying from this virus. Most of the patients that we have had who don't do well in Jamaica were elderly patients or patients with, with, with other illnesses. And this is why it's so important that you know, persons with these conditions should be protected um, from contracting, contracting the virus because they're the ones who are at risk from dying. But the other thing that makes this virus so unique and so dangerous, the fact is because most people who have this infection will not show any symptoms, hmm. they are gonna transmit the virus. They're gonna be carriers. And they're the ones who are gonna spread it because guess what, they're not sick. So therefore they will be interacting with other people because they're not ill, they'll still be going to the club. They'll still be going to the to the bar to have a drink. You know, they'll still be doing the line dancing. You know, they and and, and guess what? They're gonna spread it to other persons because they're showing no signs of the infection. And and, and I give a little statistics. Um, quite a few patients who turn up for elective surgeries, we would routinely test them for COVID nineteen. So they're not sick. They probably came in to do a hernia repair, for instance. And what we found was that a significant percentage, maybe around 5% of these patients were COVID positive. They had no symptoms, no signs, they were not ill. And to, in, in my personal opinion, that's one of the dangerous things about this virus. Wow, so, so truth or reality or myth, when the screening is done for, for this virus, um, let's say, hypothetically speaking, I'm giving an example, a person gets screened today, Eventually the results come back, it shows negative, right? So now that person don't have it. So a lot of people take it as, oh, I'm negative. So I can roam around, I can go around. And that's one example. How, what would you suggest to people that are coming negative? Should they still be following the protocols? Should they still be watching and taking care and, and, and trying to maintain the social distance and mask and everything else and sanitization? Now. If a person is, it comes back positive for coronavirus. So that positivity within that system sustains for how long? They're just carriers. They are not showing all the other symptoms. They're just positive. So what do you suggest for people like that as well? Would they remain positive for how long? How long? So I'm, I'm asking these questions because so our community, our constituents can get the the clarification and understand some gatherings little or small or medium-sized gatherings that are happening um some people enter in and say hey i'm negative so i'm, I'm cool you you're negative but you're negative at the moment when you were screened or you you sustain your negativity for how long and some people say i'm positive but i'm just carrier i'm not showing explain that so that that confusion cloud goes away so there are two general types of tests that you do for the uh, novel coronavirus or the SARS COVID-19 virus. And you have the antigen test. And what the antigen test is, is just a word that means that you test for pieces of the virus or, 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 or parts of the virus that is in the body. That tends to be a lot more uh, sensitive, but you also have an antibody test. And what the antibody test is the response putting it in a very simplistic way, is the response of your immune system that it has mounted against the presence of the virus in the body. Now, if it's an antibody test, you may have the virus, but the body may not mount the immune response that is sufficient 
to the extent where it will come up positive on a test. So a lot of times it has to do with the test that you did. One of the most accurate tests, but it takes a little time to do is, is called a, the, the PCR test. And this is one of the more accurate tests. But one of the things I wanna say is that you say, I'll give you a scenario. Someone was exposed to the virus today. You may not test positive for the first few days. And we've had pay, cases of patients who we suspected to have the coronavirus um, based on the symptoms they had, the classic symptoms. Uh, and, and the first test came back negative. And then when we retested them two or three days later, they came back positive. So, you know, I'm saying to you, the mantra that we are using now, and, and, and I would recommend that everybody use it, is that you treat everyone as if they are COVID-19 positive. You take the necessary steps to protect yourself as if everyone you are interacting with is COVID-19 positive. That is the safest way to go. Um, and of course, if you're doing the antibody test, somebody may have the virus and the virus, they may have stopped shedding and they may have recovered, but the antibodies might be in their bloodstream for a while and they may still test positive even after they have recovered and stopped shedding. In this case, the antigen test would of course become negative after a while. So there's a reason why you have the two week, um, you know, quarantine period and and you, you anticipate that if you've been exposed or you suspect an exposure, you should show signs of the disease um, you know, within that time. And also you would want a two, three week window to get through or get over the virus and to a point where you stop shedding the virus. Now, an, a very important historical note is that there was a plague, I think it might've been the, the Black Plague that decimated Europe some years ago. And I think it killed like almost like half the population of Europe. And in Venice, which was like the New York city of today, any ship that approached Venice, they would have to stop at an island off the co coast of Venice for 40 days before they were allowed to come ashore. And 40 in Italian is quarenti. And that is where you get the word quarantine from. Wow. Wow. So um, still on the same note, um, schools opening and we sending our future generation. It's important for them to be educated. We cannot stop the economy. We cannot stop the education. How, what's your take on in this confusion cloud? We still are trying to find our new norm, if you may. Vaccine, still the word is dangling in the air. We don't know yet. Um, how do you feel about that? What's your take on schools opening and, and kids returning during this time? Okay, so, so my view on it personally is that, you know, if school has to be open, and, and, I, and I know it has, you know, there, there are certain things associated with it, you know, many parents go to, both parents go to work and, um, you know, they need the children to be at school or else they'll have to hire a babysitter. Um, so if they have to go into school, what I would say is hand sanitizer. Um, each, each child should have their, a personal hand sanitizer and they should be required to sanitize their hands before they go into the school. Um, students should be required to wear face masks at all times. Social distancing should be um, strictly enforced. And any child that is sick, even though I already said that many people who have the virus don't show any symptoms, but anybody who is sick or show any sign of a respiratory illness should be asked to stay home for two weeks and possibly be tested. But the problem with children and young people is that it's difficult to get them to maintain these things because they're kids. They're gonna wanna play, they're gonna wanna wrestle, they're gonna wanna um, you know, do things that children normally do. And you know, how do you treat with this? This is the difficulty. So definitely it requires, if, if, they, if they have to go to school in person, it's gonna require strict discipline, um, constant surveillance um, and monitoring um, just to protect everyone. And here's a problem. You send a child to school, this child brings home the virus into the home. So grandma and grandpa has been staying home because grandma's diabetic and grandpa you know, um, has prostate cancer. 
And um, so they did, they have not been going anywhere, but guess what? The young people in the home have been out and about and then they bring the virus home and suddenly, you know, the grandparents become sick and, you know, tragedies can occur. So until I guess things hopefully will confirm and we have some answer to it, it's better to um, practice the, the, the precautions. So switching the gear a little bit on the law side now. So related to COVID, we have telehealth in great practice now. Uh, not that it wasn't existing before COVID, it was, but was not that popular. COVID made that necessity. Down again, thinking on a community level, thinking about our constituents. In our um, uh, sector, there's a lot of senior population here. Um, it's rough, it's tough, you know, to be, I, everybody's not IT savvy. And it, I mean, I'm 44 and trust me, for me to learn IT, I feel like, my goodness, it, it, it's too much. Uh, so I can only imagine. I can understand the fear that's, that's with it to, to see the doctor on the screen. Now you have lost that that one-on-one -on -one sitting down, that personal time with the doctor that you can explain. So it feels more like machines, like robots. However, so it's the need right now. But having the, the, the legal side of it, what would you suggest uh, to the community members as they are using telehealth um, to be mindful of? Um, and how can, and, and what will be your overall in general suggestion to get that fear out of their system and, and be friendly somehow with this and accept it if there is any, any suggestion in your mind. But first the legality side, what do you think would be a best thing for our constituents to know as they're using It's been pushed on us pretty much, so. Well, you know, the, the best medicine, as in my training or the training of, of any doctor will tell you is that the best textbook practice medicine is direct interaction with patients. Unfortunately, in the age of COVID-19, this is not, may not be most practical, especially at this time. And it would even be more so if we had a major surge, it would not be practical for you know, individuals to go to the hospital. In fact, it may not even be safe. So telemedicine is upon us. Its time has come. But there are issues with telemedicine, um, issues regarding, you know, how do you get a proper consent from patients since you don't have a paper to sign? So would you require an electronic signature or, you know, or, you know, you know, would you be assigned a special number and by entering your number or clicking on something, you, you're consenting? But also there's an the issue of, you know, how can you confirm that the person you're actually seeing on the screen is the person that you're treating, you know? Um, somebody uses their friends or their brother's um, uh, account to see the doctor. And you worry about things like even, you know, you know with electronic prescriptions, you worry about individuals, um, you know, maybe abusing um, the certain drugs. Um, but, but, but on the other side, you worry about the suspicion because most patients, especially our elderly patients, are accustomed to seeing the doctor directly and the doctor touching them and you know, squeezing different parts of their bodies. And they may be suspicious of this new technology. And the fear with this is that being suspicious of this new technology, they may not utilize it. And persons who need to be monitored closely like diabetics and hypertensives and, and other illnesses who really require routine and regular checks may fall out of the system. And this is a big problem. But then the other side of it is for the doctors and the medical practitioners. You know, while telemedicine is good, it is not the exact same thing as actually, you know, dealing directly with a patient. So is it that we will need, you know, to indemnify or, or, or protect our doctors um, from litigation arising from the, the limitations they have in treating and interacting with patients. We will have to look as a community to um, finding some way of protecting our doctors from lawsuits or you know, we, we might lose them uh, because they might be afraid of not wanting to, to, to practice in that regards. So 
a lot of discussion is required going forward with telemedicine, especially in the context where it's becoming more and more popular, more and more necessary, and more and more inclusive in terms of the patients that you have to deal with. But you know, telemedicine is the way of the future. The coronavirus is with us and it might be with us for some time to come. I hear you. So circling back to mental health, now as, uh, you know, what will be your suggestion for our elderly, particularly um, population as they are stuck at home and it is not easy. What exercise, what uh, suggestion would you give them to stay positive, to hang in and to maintain their mental health so we can go through this pandemic and eventually hopefully find some kind of norm? So the reality is the numbers are already showing that since the lockdown, since the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an increase in depression, in, in some cases, suicide, in, in, in domestic abuse. Um, and, and, and there are several reasons behind it. Uh, persons have reduced income and therefore more stress because maybe they have um, lost their jobs or, or, or their salaries may have been cut. But just people, you know, it's like cabin fever, you know, you're now around individuals that you would have only seen maybe a few hours per day and you're stuck with them 24 seven now, you know, lots of subtle things is gonna be a problem. And I think the best approach, especially regarding mental health is to take a proactive approach. As, as it relates to persons who are at risk for mental illness, um, the elderly, um, persons with certain chronic illnesses, what, what I think we should do, we should not wait until they develop mental illness, but they, but in, in offering um, telecare, we should look to not just the physical problems in terms of the problems regarding organs and systems of the body, but we should also look towards mental health, early counseling by a psychologist or a psychiatrist, de depending on how severe it is, but to be proactive, you know, check up on the person's mental health, um, have discussions with these individuals and take a proactive approach to mental health. Do not wait until a person develops a problem. So that to me is one of the big issues as it relates to mental health and also things that will reduce mental health. You know, we're approaching fall and winter, um, you know, bright lights, you know, exercise, you know, and nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with going outdoors every now and then, you know, going for short walks or brisk walks, or, or if you're wheelchair bound, you know, you know, exercise with, with your, upper, your hands, you know, your, your upper limbs. Um, doing things that we know help to reduce uh, mental illness, you know, you know proper diet, um, you know, and, and all these things, avoid the use of certain drugs and, and medication that can complicate issues regarding mental health. But overall, I think the approach has to be from a community perspective is that you, you will have to take a proactive approach to mental health. Just look at the numbers. And, and if the numbers say, oh, you know, well, five to 8% of persons are gonna develop some sort of uh, mental illness, hit hard early. Don't wait until, you know, it's set in before you start treating it. I agree. Uh, well, Kiona, I have a question on mental health, so I'll let her ask. Uh, thank you, Uzma. Dr. Glad, can you speak to individuals that are, um, I guess, current or former users, uh, individuals that huh, suffer substance abuse, individuals that have um, been clean for a certain amount of time and maybe relapsed? What can you speak to that? What kind of support or um, advice can we, what direction can we steer them in? In, in regards to like NA and AA. Right, no, so you see, this current crisis has put a lot more stress on individuals. And, you know, if they were functioning at a certain stress level, that level has now gone up. And someone who has been abusing, you know, drugs of abuse, 
or who has now gone clean, those individuals are at greater risk of using more or starting to use again because they're home, they're bored, there's nothing to do. You know, what, what will be the stimulation that they get? And, you know, as you know, just for the overall picture of mental health, uh, maybe what will need to be done as a part of the proactive approach is to call, to check in on these individuals, uh, to get the, the community health, the community mental health persons involved. So, you know, you, you have some sort of a schedule. So, so, you know, John, you know, you're supposed to call me every day at 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. And, you know, two calls have not come in then you know you might have to send someone out to check on that person. And we, we, it, it's, it's always better to be aggressive upfront than to have to deal with the repercussions of someone who has stopped using drugs or stopped injecting or whatever other type of drugs they're using who have now gone back because you know, they might disappear on you. And you know, the cost to the community is going to be greater to treat a problem than to prevent a problem. You see, that's the difference between prevention and treatment. With prevention, it costs less. Um, it's easier to deal with um, and the outcome is far better. When you have to treat, it's, it's more costly to the community, it's more costly to the government, um, it's more costly to the individual and it's more difficult to treat. But sometimes, you, you know, you may see, you may find a difficulty spending the money on the front end, because hey, nothing is wrong with this guy. Why do we need to spend money on this person? And 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 it may be difficult for you to justify, um, you know, to to your budget people. Why do we need to be so proactive? And you may not realize the cost, the true cost, on the other side. Because remember, you know, if someone in a household becomes sick, it's not just the loss of work time for that individual, their family may be affected because no, they don't work uh, and maybe their parents may or a loved one may not have to stop from work to take that person to get care. So the, the overall economic effect and, and the stress effect um, is, is, is exponential compared to had you gone in and done a proactive approach and dealt with it early before things got out of hand. Um, Thank you. I'm keeping up with the time and I know that um, we are pressing. So I will stop right here. And uh, if there is any question guys, I would say go ahead and ask now. Um, if not, then I would say thank you so much, Dr. Glegg. I don't have the words. I know you came for a short time to Atlanta and you are booked back to back, but you, are, you still uh, joined us in, on NPU platform for Wellness Wednesday. It means a lot to us. And I hope uh, that we would continue to virtually be able to see you and get your um, expertise and your suggestions to our, to our community after you make it back to Jamaica as well. You know, I, I just want to thank you for having me. And I just want to leave you with one message. We need to get the word out there to the members of the community that COVID-19 is a very, very serious problem. We have to find some way of getting that to each and every member of the community. We have to get it out there that not only is it a serious problem, and this is a highly contagious virus, but is that also the fact that COVID-19 might be around for a while. You know, you, 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 you may go into COVID burnout, to like, oh, I'm tired of this COVID-19 virus. You have to maintain constantly having education programs, um, you know, giving on masks, hand sanitizers, you know, you know, hammering it in. Because once you let up, and, and I think that's where we, we, we kind of had a problem in Jamaica, so you can learn from our experience, is that you cannot allow the population, the members of the community to get COVID burnout. You have to keep up the, the public education campaign. Invest in public education and prevention because in the end, it's going to save you much more money 
And if you can save one life, you have indeed made a big savings because the worst thing that can happen to you is to lose a loved one. So true. That is so true. This is serious disease. You are right. We cannot go COVID burn and end up parting with not practicing. And, and yes, it is in action and it has happened and it has proven. And like you said, to learn from uh, how things have happened in Jamaica. So again, thank you so much. If there's any last minute questions, please feel free while we have him for another minute. I think Ms. Jones had a question. No, I've already asked both. Uzma, Uzma asked one of my questions and I asked the other one, so I'm good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glegg. Uh, safe travels back home. Uh, you know we will stay connected uh, and I hope to see you on the virtual platform again, helping our community. We appreciate every bit of it. Thank you so much for your involvement with NPU. We truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for having me. And I, I, I just want you to make me a uh, an, an, an official um, member of your community. Though I, though I live in Jamaica, you know, um, feel free to reach out to me at, 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 at any time. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Good evening. It will be an honor. And trust me, trust me, you are a member now. As you said, I will not stop. So thank you so much, Dr. Gleg. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Gleg. And Ben. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. And we'll <laughs> bye bye.